Praise the Lord and uh, welcome everyone to the class on Romans. Uh, welcome to our uh, online students, Paul, John, Zelatoli. We have only one in-person student that is uh, Jeffina. And also welcome to our uh, e-learning students who will be listening to this lecture uh, later on. Um, last week we studied chapter five. It was quite a powerful chapter. Uh, you know, where Paul laid the truth of our uh, foundations of the truth of our identification. Uh, we'll move on to chapter six, which is another very powerful chapter where he speaks about how sin's power is broken. So before we uh, do a short recap of chapter five and move on to chapter six, uh, can one of you please lead us in prayer, please? Anyone? Anyone can lead us in prayer? Paul, can you lead us in prayer? Father Almighty God, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for bringing us together today in this class. We pray for the guidance of the Holy Spirit to come and guide us, open our spiritual eyes, spiritual understanding, so that all what we are going to learn should bear fruits. We commit the teacher into in your hand. We commit our internet connection into your hand. Father Lord, we pray, believing that all this will be for the glory of your name. We pray and declare this in Jesus Christ's name, Son of the living God. Amen. 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 Thank you, Paul. So we we'll just briefly uh, do a recap of chapter 5. So in chapter 5, Paul has laid the foundation of the truth of our identification. He tells us in Adam, you know, who he calls as the first Adam, the first man, the natural man, uh, the man of the earth. And he says that through this first Adam, the first man, the natural man, the man of the earth, he says we have inherited sin. And because of sin, we have inherited death and everything else that came as a result of sin, okay? And it says that we became uh, enemies of God, we were without strength, uh, condemned, uh, we faced the wrath of judgment and eternal judgment that is hell as a result of being part of Adam's race, okay? And then he talks about the truth of our identification in Christ, and here he refers to to Christ as the last Adam, the second man, the spiritual man, the man from heaven. And uh, because of what Christ did on the cross, you know, Paul says, we inherited peace with God, uh, the gift of righteousness. We are justified. We are made righteous. It says we have received abundance of grace. Uh, so we have the right standing in grace. We are saved from the wrath of God. Uh, we have eternal hope. We experience the love of God. We have the life of God in us. We reign in life over every uh, demonic oppression, challenges that we face. And he says we bear the image or the nature of Christ in us. Or we bear the image or the likeness or the nature of the heavenly man in us. So he's lay these powerful truths of uh, the truths of our identification in chapter five. And now he uh, go, uh, you know, talks about in chapter six, you know, um, in, in chapter six, he's basically sharing what he has always spoken about, uh, what we have received in Christ, that we have received the abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness. So he is, uh, you know, countering a question that people could ask, uh, which is, should we continue in sin because God is giving us so much grace? Okay, so he's thinking for his uh, people, his Jewish audience, the people who would be reading his letter. He's thinking in their mind what they would think. So he says, hey, these people would think, okay, now we have the abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness. So you know, uh, should we continue in sin because God is giving us so much grace? So he's saying we are forgiven, we are made righteous, we are justified by the grace of God. Uh, but he says we need to understand that 
and also about how to live a life free from sin. Okay, so he's saying that we are forgiven, made righteous, and justified by the grace of God. We understand that, but how about how about living uh, life free from sin? So should we continue living in sin? Okay, so now he's basically transitioning to Christian living. He says, you know, how do we live in view of the cross and what has happened as a result of the cross in our lives? What Christ has purchased for us on the cross. So what he's bringing out in Romans 6 is an in-depth understanding of the truth of our ident identification. He introduced it for us in Romans chapter 5, who we are in Adam and who we are in, in Christ. He's saying that is good. You know, we have received now the truth of our identification, but let's take it a little more deeper. Let's look at our, our understanding, our identification with Christ. What does it mean? How does it affect our lives? So Paul is saying, hey, not only are we forgiven of sin, but we're delivered from sin, so we don't have to live as slaves to sin anymore. Okay, so he has said that because of Adam's sin, you know, we have all inherited sin as a result of death. A uh, result of it, death has come and everything else. But in Romans 6, he says, we have been set free from sin. And he explains to us how that happened. Okay. Now, based on the title of this chapter, the title of this chapter is Sin's Power, is, uh, Sin's Power Broke, is Broken. What is he talking about? Okay, uh, did Paul already talk about sin? Yes, he's already spoken about sin. So, what has he already established about sin and salvation uh, in chapters uh, two, three? Uh, you know, he's already established the fact that we are all sinners. That Jesus died for our sins. We are all forgiven. Uh, his righteous, we are made righteous. His uh, how are we made righteous? His righteousness has been imputed upon us, has been put into our account, and hence we are righteous. We have been made justified, uh, and we have a right standing in grace. Okay. Now, when he is spoken about all of these things, then why is he talking about sin here? Okay. Uh, why is he coming back to talking about sin when he's already established all of these facts that, hey, we're all sinners, we've sinned, we've fallen short of the glory of God, you know, but um, uh, Christ died for us, we're forgiven, we're made righteous, we've been, his righteousness has been put into our account, imputed into our account, and we have a right standing in grace. Now, when he's spoken about everything, why is he coming back to talking about sin here? Now, like I said in the introduction, that this letter is not chapter wise, but you know, it's a letter. And we need to have the forward look and the backward look. Okay. So, what he introduced initially in chapter one, he will further explain or build on it later on. Similarly, when interpreting something in the later chapter, we might need to maintain a backward look, which means we need to interpret it in the light or we need to read it now in the context of what has already been spoken of or what has been introduced to us or what has been taught to us or what Paul really mentions or writes about, okay? Or what has also, uh, what has already been stated on that subject previously, okay? So in chapter three, Paul talks about sin. He says, all have sinned and we are justified or made righteous by faith. Okay. And um, just like um, uh, he raised several questions to bring out the truth, you know, similarly, he raises some questions in this chapter or in this part of this letter as well. Okay. So he raises up uh, quite a lot of questions. So he basically addresses uh, the main issue or the problem of sin by stating two main questions. So in this chapter, he addresses the main issue of the problem of sin uh, by asking two main questions. Okay, uh, so the, the question is in verse 1, shall we continue to sin that grace may abound? Verse 1. 
And verse 15, shall we sin because we are not under the law, but under the grace? Okay. So to answer these two main questions, which he asked in verse 1 and verse 15, you know, he has uh, many follow-up questions, uh, which these questions point through the spiritual truths that he wants to elaborate or to bring uh, to our um, notice or he wants to explain to us. So the first question, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound, was one. Uh, the the follow-up questions that he asked is, how shall we who had died, who have been dead to sin, live any longer in it, was two. And then he also brings about another question, follow-up question for the, this main question in verse 3. Do you not know that as many that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Okay, so these are the two follow-up questions that he's asking in verse 2 and verse 3, which helps him to answer the main question: shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Now, the second main question, shall we sin because we are not under the law, but under the grace, verse 15, he asked two follow-up questions. The first follow-up question is in verse 16. He says, do you not know that to whom you present yourselves slaves to obey, you are that one's slaves whom you obey, whether of sin leading to death or of disobedience leading to righteousness? And then verse 21 what fruit did you have then in the things of which you are now ashamed? Okay. So Paul responds to these two main questions. He introduces us um, to the truth about identification and how that sets us, how that has set us free from the dominion or the power of sin. Okay. And then he presents five actions that we must take. Uh, to live a life free from sin under grace. And he also presents to us the truth that God's grace has made us free from sin. Okay, And then he goes on to say, hence, what should be our response to God's grace? So he's, he presents five actions that we must take to live a life free from sin and under grace. And he also presents us with the truth that God's grace has made us free from sin sin and then he goes on to ask us our response to god's grace so what should be our response our response should be that you know we willingly make ourselves as slaves to god and slaves to righteousness which results in holy living before god okay so with this uh, background let's study chapter six okay so this is just basically a brief background I gave about chapter 6. Now we will study chapter 6 in detail. So verses 1, 2, and 3, where he talks about more sin and more grace. So can one of you please read Romans chapter 6, uh, verses 1, 2, and 3, please? What shall, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. How shall we who die to sin live any longer in it? Or do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Amen. Thank you, Subhashish. So having presented to us the powerful truth that we are justified by faith and that where sin abounded, you know, uh, grace abounds all the more. Uh, Paul addresses a question that we, that could arise in the minds of the of the Jews or the Gentiles, or the people that's reading his letter. Uh, the question is, shall we all just keep on sinning so that you know God can keep giving us more and more grace? So this is a question that he thinks his readers uh, will think about or will pop up in the mind of people you know who he is writing this letter to. So what is his answer? His answer to the question, shall we just keep on sinning so God can keep giving us more grace and more grace? What is the answer he says? He says, certainly not. He says, absolutely no. Why? Why does he say? What is the reason he gives us? 
he says we are dead to sin okay so he's saying hey so common you know thinking logical thinking that dead people cannot sin that people do not sin and that people cannot sin okay so he says you're already dead to sin which means hey you cannot sin any longer and you you know you, you cannot sin and you you know dead people do not sin and then he says we are baptized into christ okay very interesting he says we are baptized into christ we are baptized into his death so here is he talking about water baptism or some other baptism any thoughts over here and he's saying you know we are baptized into christ we are baptized into his death uh, is paul referring to water baptism or he's referring to some other baptism Come on, can I have some answers, please? It's okay even if you're wrong, doesn't matter. Is he referring to water baptism? Or is he referring to some other baptism? Some other baptism. Okay, thank you, Rosalind. Some other baptism. Jeffina says not specifically water baptism, I believe so. So but she says some other. Yes, he's not talking about water baptism, but he's talking about some other baptism. And what is that? Spiritual baptism. Okay. He's talking about spiritual baptism. Why do we say he's talking about spiritual baptism? Because he says we have been baptized into Christ. Okay. Now we must understand, uh, you know, what the, the author is trying to say from the language of the author okay from the language of the author we could we can understand what he's meaning to say or what he would intended to uh, say so from this uh, son what would he mean being baptized into christ okay or we can look at where else in scripture do we find this written about so we can get a better understanding okay so paul writes about this in first corinthians chapter 12 verse uh, 13 okay um you know and it says that the holy you know it means here that the holy spirit baptizes us into the body of christ the holy spirit baptizes us into the body of christ and we're not baptized in water but we are baptized in christ Yes, water baptism is a physical outward expression of what we are reading here in Romans chapter 6, verse 3. Okay, so uh, what happens inwardly, the spiritual baptism that we are spiritually identifying with Christ's uh, death, his burial, his resurrection, his uh, ascension, and him being seated at the right hand of the father that is our spiritual identity identity we identify with christ spiritually in all of these areas when we are born again so that is something that is spiritual that is something that is inward that happens and of course water baptism is the physical outward expression of what is being mentioned in romans uh, chapter 6 verse 3 so romans chapter 6 verse 3 is not referring to water baptism but uh, spiritual uh, baptism but water baptism yes is a physical expression of that spiritual reality that we have experienced uh, inside us in our spirit man when we are born again so what he uh, what he is focusing on is the spiritual truth okay what is the spiritual truth the spiritual truth is that all of us as believers or all of us who are born again we have been baptized into christ or we have been brought into christ or we have been immersed into christ or we have been put into christ or we have been clothed in christ so it can refer to all of these things it can refer to us uh, uh, to be baptized into christ means we are brought into christ okay we are immersed into christ we are put into christ and we are clothed into uh, christ 
So he says, when we are baptized um, uh, into Christ, we are baptized into his death. Okay? By the coming into Christ, we now identify with his death. That is what it means, we are baptized into his death. That means we identify with Christ's death. And it's a powerful expression. It's a powerful proclamation of the spiritual truth of our identification with Christ. And what is our spiritual truth of our identification with Christ is that we have been dead, buried, resurrected, ascended, and seated the right hand of God along with Jesus Christ. So we identify with Christ in all of these things, and it's a spiritual identification okay so this is something for us to understand that christ died 2000 years back you know and here we are 2000 years later uh, when we are hearing the gospel you know we we, uh, we believe in jesus christ uh, we receive jesus christ as our personal savior and you know uh, we are baptized into him okay so when we receive christ as our personal savior uh, we are baptized into Jesus Christ. That means we are immersed into him spiritually. We become one with him spiritually. We identify with him in all of these uh, things. So when we are brought into Christ or immersed into Christ, God says what happened to Christ 2,000 years ago becomes effective uh, in you and me uh, today. And how is that possible? Okay. Uh, we already spent time explaining it in Romans chapter 5. Okay, Paul has already explained to us in Romans chapter 5. Because of Adam, you know, because we are in Adam, we have received, we have become all sinners, you know, we have sinned and death has come upon us. Um, and, you know, we are affected by what happened 6,000 years back by one man's disobedience. And the same truth is continuing here that christ died two thousand years ago today you and i who believe in jesus uh, we are baptized into christ we are immersed into him spiritually and the moment we identify with him we identify with his death okay so spiritually we are made one with christ okay so when we are baptized into Christ, it means spiritually we are made one with Christ. And because we are made one with Christ or baptized into Christ, you know, we are baptized into his death or we identify with his death. Okay. So what does it mean? Uh, we baptize into his death. It means spiritually we are being made one with Christ. And because we have been made one with Christ, we are baptized into Christ, and because of that, we are baptized into his death, which means we identify with his death. Okay, so we understand more about how we identify with his death, his burial, his resurrection, his ascension, seated at the right hand of God as we look through this chapter. Okay, so how do we identify with Christ? We look at verses 4 and 5. So can one of you please read Romans chapter 6, verses 4 and 5? And before you read that, anyone has any questions? Okay, if there are no questions. So can somebody please read verses 4 and 5, please, for us? Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection. Amen. Thank you, Rosalind. So Paul is going on to say, hey, not only have, been, have we been baptized, or we have been immersed into his death since we are part of his death, but we have, you know, we are also buried with him. And when Christ, when Christ was buried, we were also buried with him. So he's saying through baptism into that means we are baptized into his death. And not only are we buried with him, but just as Christ was raised up from the dead, 
by the glory of the Father, uh, you know, uh, it says Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father. It means that he was resurrected. So we also have been resurrected with him. Okay. So all this he's talking about in the spiritual sense are, uh, you know, that we identify with Christ's death, his burial, his resurrection is all our spiritual identification. Okay. Romans 8, 11 says Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father. And we know that Christ was raised by the Spirit of God. Okay. So here in, um, in uh, verse 4, where he says he was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father. The word glory in Greek is doxa. Okay, and it's often used to refer to the nature and the works of God revealed to us or manifested to us. Okay, it's basically the manifestation of who God is and what he does, a demonstration of his power. Okay, so we understand that it is the spirit of God that causes the glory of the Father to be revealed. Okay, so Paul is saying we have received abundance of grace, we have received the gift of righteousness, and something more has happened to us. What is that something more? He says we have also been baptized into Christ, we are identified with Him spiritually. Because we identify with Him spiritually, we identify with His death, burial, and His resurrection. So what Christ did 2,000 years back, you know, has meaning and implications for our life today. Okay? So how does it have meaning and implication for our life today? How does it matter to you and me today? That is what Paul goes on to explain. Okay? He says we should walk in newness of life. So... Our resurrection is telling us that we are walking in the newness of life, okay? Life here, the Greek word for life here is zoe, which means the newness uh, of the God kind of life. And it also means that we are now living in the abundant life of God. That is the life we are walking in, that is God's life and God's nature that is in us okay so we are have received the newness of the god kind of life we are living in the abundant life of god here and now and that is the life we are living in god's life and god's nature that is operating in and through us he says that is what we should walk in the newness of life the zoe life the god kind of life okay um we look at verse um, 5, okay? But if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection, okay? So it says here that we died with him, we will also be raised with him. So the whole thing about death, burial, and resurrection we are with him, we identify with him, we are united together uh, in Christ, we identify with Christ, which means that when Christ died, we died, when he was buried, we were buried, when he resurrected, we are also resurrected, and all this is talking about in the spiritual uh, sense, okay? So in Romans 6, you know, uh, of course, he does not mention the ascending part, that Jesus, you know, ascended and seated at the right hand of the Father. But we we know that um, uh, from Ephesians chapter 2, verse 6, where it says he was raised up, uh, and he says, where it says that he raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So, have, so Ephesians chapter 2, verse 6 says how we have been raised up together with Christ. And we have, he has made us sit, uh, he has made us to sit together with him in the heavenly places in Christ 
Jesus. Okay. So in Romans chapter six, we don't talk about our spiritual identification when it comes to Christ's ascension and him being seated at the right hand of the Father, but the spiritual identification is made known to us, or the truth is revealed to us in Ephesians chapter two, verse six. So this verse says that we are also united or we also identify with Christ in his ascension. So when Christ ascended, we also ascended. Uh, that means we also ascended spiritually. Uh, and what does it mean? What does it mean, uh, you know, when we say that we ascended with Christ spiritually or we identify with Christ spiritually when he ascended into heaven? It means that the system of this world has no longer control over a believer. Okay? So the system of this world has no longer control over us because we have been, we have ascended, okay? Uh, and why do we say that? Because a believer has been taken out of this world, okay? And we're all, we're talking all about this in the spiritual sense. So he's saying spiritually who you are. You're somebody, you know, who, are, who is living in this world, but you are, you are in the world, but you are of the world, Okay. Uh, which means the system of this world has no more control about you. So he, what is he coming to say is basically because you do not belong to this world, you do not belong to the system of this world, the power of sin no longer is operative over your life. The power of sin is rendered null and void over your life. The power of sin has no claim over your life. The power of sin has no dominion and authority and right over your life. Why? Because spiritually you have ascended. You are, you know, uh, above the systems of this world. The systems of this world has no control over you. What is the system of this world? It's the power of sin. Okay. So he's saying that you have been taken out of this world and he's talking about this in the spiritual sense. If you read Ephesians chapter 2 verses uh, 1 and 2, he says, and you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins in which you once walked according to uh, the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience. Okay, Ephesians chapter 2 verses 1 and 2. So this verse tells us that there is a system of disobedience. There is a system of rebellion that is working in this world. Okay, And the people who are living in this world are under the prince of the power of the air. And we refer to this as the system of evil and rebellion. Okay, And so Paul is saying that Hey, you and I are not under that influence. We are not under the prince of the air. We are not under the system of uh, disobedience and rebellion that is at work in this world. Why? Because we have been raised up with Jesus Christ. We have ascended. We are far above this uh, world. Okay. So, we, yes, we live in a world where there is spiritual darkness, there is evil, there is corruption. Uh, there is moral degradation, but that should not dominate or influence a believer. Why? Because we have been raised with Jesus Christ. Amen. We are raised with Jesus Christ. Spiritually, we have been taken out of that influence. We have been taken out of, um, you know, uh, the influence of this world. And he says, hence, you know, we can dominate this world. So he says, remember in chapter 5, he says how uh, we, we can reign in life, right? Because of what Christ has done for us, what he has purchased for us on the cross, we are in a position where we reign in life, which means we reign over every demonic force, authority, principalities, uh, powers of uh, darkness. So he's saying, hence, we can dominate this world and not let the darkness dominate us not let the systems of this world dominate us so he's you know we are the light we are more powerful than darkness and it's sad that most believers do not know this and hence they are living under the darkness they have not realized what christ has done for them what 
crisis purchase for them what is their truth of their spiritual identification where they are in their standing with god what is their spiritual inheritance they are so um, you know uh, it's so sad that they, they don't even know these uh, 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 these truths okay and then ephesians chapter 2 verse 6 says uh, and has raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Okay, so we saw how we identified with his ascension. We identify with his ascension spiritually when we are born again. And it means that we are above the systems of this world. We can dominate the systems of this world, the, the spirits of rebellion, of disobedience, um, sin, evil, corruption. Um, because we are light um, and, uh, you know, um, we don't let the darkness dominate us. And then he, you know, we also read in Ephesians chapter 2 verse 6 that we are seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So Paul mentions in Ephesians that we are also united or identify with Christ spiritually in his exaltation. Okay. When Christ was made to sit at the right hand of the Father, you and I, spiritually saying, have also been made to sit at the right hand of the Father. That means what? What does that mean? What does it mean that spiritually now that we are seated, when we are seated at the right hand of God the Father, along with Jesus Christ, what does it mean spiritually? Anyone? What does it mean spiritually? Yes, thank you, Jeffina. So Jeffina says we have the authority and the power. It means we are placed in a place of highest authority. The right hand of God means the place of authority and power and dominion and rule. It signifies authority and power. The right hand of God basically signifies authority and rule. So Christ has, God has placed us along with Christ in a place of highest authority, you know, and God could not place you and me in any other higher place of authority than this. So we are seated together with Christ and this is our place of authority and dominion in the spiritual realm. Okay. So on this earth, we operate out of that place of authority, okay? So when we confront demonic powers or when we confront challenges in our life, we operate from that place of dominion and authority. We need to understand where we are seated, our spiritual identification of where we are standing, where we are seated, where we are is also important. So once we understand where we are seated, that we are seated at the right hand of God, we operate out of that place of dominion and authority. You know, uh, why? Because we are seated in the heavenly places and we need to understand or we need to remember that we are not striving for authority we don't have to strive for authority we just have to exert our authority so striving and exerting are two different things okay many believers think that we must strive for authority so to strive for authority they do all kinds of things like you know fasting and praying and they do this and do that now i'm not against all these spiritual disciplines of course these spiritual disciplines are very very important um and i'm not against that and i'm not saying please don't do it these disciplines are important for us to be in good spiritual condition so that we are fit to uh, to be used for what god um, uh, is taking hold of or we're fit to use what god has given to us but we don't have to strive for authority all we need to do is we're already in a place of authority we just have to exert our authority we just have to use our um authority and we use our uh, uh, exert our authority by faith in god and using the word of god and by using the power that there is in the name of jesus and we use it with a sense of humility and in faith so we exert the authority that has been given to us by faith in god the word of god and by using the power that is there in the name of jesus 
So Paul basically in Romans chapter 5, in uh, Ephesians chapter uh, 4, and also, uh, you know, in Corinthians, he mentions about this truth of our um, identification, where he says we identify, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, where he says we identify with Christ's death, his crucifixion, his death, his, uh, his sorry, his death, his burial, his resurrection, his ascension, and him being seated at the right hand of the Father, okay? So what does it mean for us today? Or how does it affect our lives today? And that is what, you know, Paul is going to be explaining to us. So remember what he started out with? He started out with a question. He started out with this question, should we continue to live in sin? And he says, hey, you know, there's no way we can continue in sin. Why? Because we're all dead to sin. Okay, so dead, when we're dead to sin, sin, we cannot sin. There's no longer that there is a possibility that we can sin. And then he's going to, you know, explain to us how this happens. Okay, so in order to explain this to us, he has introduced the truth or he's introduced this truth of how we have been united together or how we are, uh, how, or how we are being identified with Christ in his death, his burial, his resurrection, ascension, and him seated at the right hand of the Father. Okay, and now he's going to explain to us little by little how this affects us being free from sin. Okay, so having helped us understand this truth of our identification in Romans chapter 5, Romans chapter 6, he goes on uh, to say, you know, what do you do with it? How do you live with it? Okay, so his primary interest is in dealing with sin. You know, how do we live with this, tru uh, this truth with respect or to the aspect of sin? And this is the primary focus. And we identify with Christ and how we can live in holiness. So in Romans chapter 6 and 7 and most part of Romans chapter 8, he's answering these, uh, this question. That we are in Christ. You know, we identify with him now. And how do we become holy or how do we overcome? sin okay we'll move on to verses six and seven before we move on to verses six and seven anyone has any questions please any doubts any anything you want me to explain again no okay if not we'll move on to verses six and seven can somebody please read for us verses six and seven please Knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin, for he who has died has been freed from sin. Amen. Thank you, Roslyn. So, you know, um, verse 6, he begins with know these two words, you know, knowing this, you know. So many believers do not know this truth, sadly, okay? Um, and this is something that we must know without knowing or having the revelation or spiritual understanding of this truth, you know, we will not be able to walk in it, okay? And then he talks about the old man versus the new man, okay? So the old man refers to the sinful nature or uh, it refers to sinful nature in the unsaved human spirit okay the old man came through adam okay the old man came through adam and the new man came through jesus christ now when we say that jesus was the last adam we understand it because in jesus you know um uh, in Jesus, the old man comes to an end, okay? And in Jesus starts the new man. That is why we say we are a new creation in Christ. 
So in contrast, the new man is referring to the divine nature that is in us, the divine nature which is created in the image of God in utter righteousness and true holiness. Okay. The old man, which is the old sinful nature, has the inclination to sin. What happened to the old man? Paul says, what happens to the old man? What does Paul say? It was crucified with him. Okay. So when Christ was crucified, you and I were also crucified. Now, it doesn't mean that we were there when Jesus Christ was crucified. It just means that when we repent of our sins, when we accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, the moment we do that, it means that spiritually, you know, um, that, um, uh, you know, uh, you and I were also crucified with him. So what part of us was crucified? The old man. Okay, The old man was crucified and was put together, which means it was an end of it. Okay, The old man is no longer alive in us because the old man is already crucified. It's dead. So as believers, you and I don't have the old man, but as believers, you and I you and I have what? The new man, which comes through Jesus Christ. Okay, so we have the new man, which comes through Jesus Christ. So there is no sinful nature in your spirit. The mind has to be made new so it can think differently. The body has to be crucified. Why? Because the body would still like to behave like the old man but it has to be retained to live according to the new man, or it has to be retrained, sorry, it has to be retrained to live according to the new man, and which Paul will explain to us in the rest of these verses in this chapter, uh, in Romans chapter 6. But we need to understand this, that in a spirit man, there is no more the old man, but it's the new man. There's no more the old nature, but it's the new nature okay but in our bodies and in our and our minds we need to renew our bodies and our minds and we need to retrain our bodies to think and behave like the new man we'll continue from romans chapter 6 verse 6 um on friday anyone has any questions before we end class no questions Okay, thank you, everyone. I hope you enjoyed, uh, you know, the powerful truths that we've been learning from Romans chapter 5 and 6. And I hope we are going to be living out these truths and what Christ has purchased for us on the cross. Reign in life and live the truth of your identification of who you are in Christ. God bless you all. Have a wonderful week uh, day and a wonderful week ahead. See you all on Friday. Thank you.